Good afternoon, everyone. I see we have already 60 participants and counting. So welcome to this webinar organized by the ACM Europe Council and uh, the RAISE Working Group from that council. So my name is uh, Michel Baudouin Lafont. I'm a professor at the uh, Université Paris-Saclay in France. Uh, I've been a founding member of the ACM Europe Council uh, and currently a member of the RAISE Working Group. And so the goal of this working group is to achieve greater visibility of European research within ACM. Um, and today's webinar will focus on how to get more European researchers recognized by ACM awards uh, and ACM honors. And so we have a great panel uh, for you. Uh, we'll start with the first session uh, with the ACM president and the ACM Europe Council president, or chair rather. Uh, but before we start, uh, I would like to uh, give some uh, practical information. Uh, so first, this webinar is being recorded. Um, the recording will be made available after the session. So uh, if you had a chance to attend uh, or want to tell people who couldn't attend, it will be available. Um, there's live captioning available at the bottom of your window. There's a live transcript button and you can click there to activate it. Um, next to it, there is a Q&A button. So if you want to ask questions to the panel, please use the Q&A uh, window uh, rather than the chat window. Um, and in the Q&A window, you can see the, uh, uh, the sort of questions and you can uh, upvote them, which will help us to moderate the session. Um, and uh, you can use the chat if you need to, if you want to make comments or provide a pointer to some information, but please the Q&A window for the questions. Uh, and finally, at the end uh, of the webinar, when, you, when we uh, shut it down, you'll have a window asking you for feedback and you'll get an email, in fact, uh, also uh, where you can fill, fill out that form after the fact if you don't want to do it right, right then. So uh, we really value your, your feedback. So um, let's get started because we have a, <laughs> a limited time. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, uh, ACM president. So Gabriel Kotsis is full professor in computer science at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz, Austria. Uh, she was a member of the ACM Europe Council, uh, among a bunch of other responsibilities. Uh, but most importantly today, she's uh, talking to us as ACM president. And so Gabriele, uh, the floor is yours to introduce yourself and ACM. Yes, thank you very much, Michelle, for the nice introduction. Um, I would like to use the opportunity to tell you a few words about ACM, although I know that you already know a lot about ACM, but it's really a big organization. Actually, we are a big organization, and there are many, many things that are even new to me being a president. I'm recognizing new aspects every other day. So I would like to start uh, my presentation with a few facts and figures about ACM. We are the world's oldest and largest society for computing researchers and practitioners. So we are a member society. Membership is based on an individual and we have reached the threshold of over 100,000 members worldwide last year. We are reaching worldwide professionals and students through our technical, scientific and education activities. And this goes, of course, beyond our membership because some of our activities are available to the general public as well. And our vision statement, as you can see from the website, is to see a world where computing helps solve tomorrow's problems, where we use our knowledge and skills to advance the profession and make a positive impact. So you see that this ambition is quite challenging, but I truly believe that computer science is the emerging technology of the future and the key technology to solve many of the challenges that we are currently facing in the world. I would like to show you here this figure which shows the roughly the distribution of ACM members worldwide. The um, bigger the spots are, the more members are here. And you see, of course, that most of our members come from the US and from Europe. And it's a little bit more sparse in the other regions of the world. But this also relates a little bit to the distribution of computer scientists and professionals in general. But there's still room to go. And as it is the objective of this specific webinar, we also like to increase the visibility of the research that our members are doing and we would like to act as a reflector for their research and the awards are an excellent opportunity for doing so. Um, 
Next to me, there will be Yula speaking as chair of um, the ACM Europe Council. And this gave me the idea that it might be interesting for you to see a little bit about the organizational structure of ACM, because what you for sure know and see from ACM are our special interest groups. Our special interest groups focus on specific topics like computer architecture, computer networks, mobile computing, or human computer interaction. And here you work with the other colleagues in your discipline on specific topics. Our conferences are, of course, well known, our publications, etc. But apart from the SIG structure, there are also various boards and councils within ACM, which help us doing our work. So the boards more or less represent bodies where people come together, and it's again mostly members of ACM, so we are also organization-wise a member-driven organization with support, of course, from ACM headquarters. We have the Publications Board, which is responsible for all publications in the digital library, and it's also responsible for, for example, issues like plagiarism and publication-related ethics. There are special sub-boards within the Publications Board. We have the Education Board, which is mainly looking at curriculum development, guidelines, standards, etc. We have the SIG Governing Board, which is a board uniting the various special interest group leaders and they discuss common aspects. So recently, they are, of course, very much active in discussing how future conferences would look like and would be shaped in this virtualization that we are experiencing by force, by external force, but the truly belief that virtual and hybrid conferences will stay with us for the future. And there's the practitioner's board, which offers specific services for our practitioner members, for our professional members, including webinars, podcasts, meetups, speakers, program, etc. And then there are the councils. There's, of course, the ACM council, which is more or less the board of directors with representatives from the chairs of the boards, but also members at large. And this is also one element where I came more involved into the organization of ACM because I was a member of the ACM Council for um, two periods. Then there are the thematic councils, which have been added most recently to address, for example, specific topic, topics from a strategic point of view. We do have a technology policy council, which tries to influence or at least to give advice or the computer science perspective on various problems to um, political decision makers. There was, was, for example, um, a contribution on um, bias in artificial intelligence. There was a contribution towards digital votes. And all those topics where computer scientists can contribute knowledge advice. We do not make the politics. We just inform the politicians about the computer science perspective and give them, for example, also guidelines um, on how to best design technology to ensure democracy and, and participation and things like that. And last but not least, there are the regional councils and ACM Europe is one of them. We also have ACM China and ACM India. They are special to the extent that they have their own bylaws. They are still part of ACM, but they elect their own officers and executive committee and members. So they are really organizations within the ACM organization and they are dedicated to promote the visibility of the specific region both um, within ACM but also worldwide so that there is a body where you can um, meet and discuss. Um, one thing that I would like to mention, I have been mentioning it before in several of our speeches, and you're probably aware of that. I hope that you all know our digital library, the ACM Digital Library, which is a large um, resource of the most important publications, I may say, that we have in computer science. You will find the articles, you will find um, also functions for doing your literature search. We started a little bit with creating author profiles, so all those functions will be improved. But the most important change is that the ACM Digital Library is going to become open access. This was a decision made at the ACM Council a couple of years ago with the ambitious goal of making it open access in five years. So there are only a few years to go until we have reached that. And um, 
it will be, of course, an, an important step because I truly believe that our research results, our research output must be visible also to the general public and should be as broadly accessible as possible. But of course, there are a lot of business issues associated with that as well, because there are costs in maintaining a digital library and they have to be covered from somewhere. So this is just an announcement that um, you will see changes here as well. Um, I would like to conclude my presentation, my short presentation, with highlighting some of the issues that I also wrote in my statement when I was running for ACM president, because I'm really convinced that computing machinery, we are the Association for Computing Machinery, and computing machinery will shape our future and will contribute towards major goals. Of specific interest is computing machinery fighting the CO2 dilemma. I think this is a very important topic. By chance, I would say we are already contributing a lot to that in having, for example, this meeting virtually, which is much more CO2 neutral than if we would have met um, on a physical place. But it's um, also an issue that we have to consider in the long term. And um, I recently was um, talking with the, um, I think it was the German president of, of informatics, GE. And he was saying that he's frequently asked whether computer science promotes or actually causes more troubles in the CO2 dilemma, because of course computing also requires power and resources and we really must consider this as an important topic and address this. Um, another important topic is computing machinery, fertilizing medical research and healthcare. When I wrote this statement, this was in the pre-COVID area, but we have seen the significant um, achievements that can be made if our forces are put together and also here computing machinery can contribute a lot can help a lot um, on the one hand because it's a tool that can be used in the analysis itself but also on the other hand and this relates again to the previous topic of having the digital library open it helps in disseminating the knowledge very quickly and i think it was really contributing to this joint effort that we came up so quickly with all those um, vaccination possibilities against COVID. And last but not least, computing machinery protecting democracy. With all this digitalization and virtualization, we must not forget that there are many people who do not have adequate access to um, computing machinery, to computer and information technology, and we must make sure that um, we still can protect democracy in that respect. So with that, I would like to conclude my short presentation about ACM and yeah I think that's it for the moment for the start thank you okay thank you Gabriela um, so I'm now gonna uh, give the floor to Panayota Faturu who's a professor in computer science at the University of Crete in Greece and uh, she is uh, currently the chair of the ACM Europe Council and she'll tell us a bit more about ACM Europe and about this webinar today uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Uh, hello, I would uh, like to, my name is Panagiotta Faturu. I am the chair of the ACM Europe Council, and I would like to warmly welcome you to this webinar, uh, getting recognized by ACM Awards and Honors, which is organized by the Council, and more specifically by its newly established ACM Europe Research Visibility Working Group. In this short presentation, I will try to uh, give you uh, some, uh, to briefly discuss uh, recent activity of the Council and uh, our current priorities. The ACM Europe Council aims at promoting dialogue uh, on technology policy issues between the uh, European Commission and other governmental bodies and funding agencies in Europe and the computing community. Uh, this work is done through the ACM Europe Technology Policy Committee, which is one of the committees of the active committees of the Council. Uh, we also aim at fostering computer science education in Europe, work that is done in the context of Informatics for All. Uh, Informatics for All is a coalition between the Council, Informatics Europe, and uh, CIPIS. Um, one of our main goals uh, the last few years uh, uh, has been to contribute towards awarding and disseminating the achievements of European computer professionals. Uh, in this context, uh, we have established two working groups. The first was established uh, uh, two years ago, 
It is the ACM Europe Fellows Working Group, uh, which uh, uh, is chaired by Anastasia Ilamaki, and its goal is to increase the number of ACM fellows and uh, the number of nominations for ACM fellows and ACM distinguished members from Europe. Uh, more recently, about six months ago, we have established the ACM Europe Research Visibility Working Group, which is chaired by myself, and I'm going to give you some more information later on, given that this is a working group that organizes this webinar. Uh, the Council uh, aims also at supporting gender equality in the European computing landscape, and there is a, a very serious work that is done in this direction by the ACMW Europe Committee. Uh, our main, maybe the most important uh, priority of the Council right now is uh, uh, to enhance uh, um, uh, is, uh, to enhance research visibility and give credit to this with European researchers. Uh, uh, in addition to establishing these two working groups that I mentioned previously, we have already nominated Europeans for a awards and some of these nominations have been successful and uh, we have contributed names for the ACM Distinguished Speakers Program and uh, for uh, uh, names for the evaluation committee of the of this program of the DSP and we had uh, a lot of other activity which um, is not uh, I don't have the time to summarize all of it uh, right now. Uh, let me mention though that uh, we in 2020 we made a lot of effort to enhance the communication mechanisms through which the Council reaches you, reaches the Europeans, uh, and uh, you can see here in the table that um, by simply sending an email to inform you about uh, your eligibility to become a senior member and encouraging you and by encouraging you to uh, self-nominate for this member grade, uh, we had a high impact. Uh, the numbers went up by an order of magnitude. Uh, another priority of the Council is uh, to work with the younger generation and try to understand their needs and how to address these needs. Uh, let me now say a few more words about uh, ACM Euro Prize, which is, as I said, the working group that uh, basically organizes this webinar. Uh, we have five goals and five uh, uh, working teams, uh, each one uh, devoted to fulfill the goal. The first goal is to increase visibility of European research excellence. And under this item, we mainly try to do work in the direction of increasing the number of uh, nominations from Europe for, ACM, for the ACM awards. Our second goal is to promote Europe-centric events, uh, with the emphasis being given to um, uh, events for the younger generation. Um, our third goal is to work with the ACM management and collaborate with the SIGs to make Europe more visible to ACM and vice versa. Uh, the fourth goal is uh, to increase awareness about opportunities for recognition of the work of Europeans through the ACM programs and activities, and to promote the participation of, European, of Europeans in these programs and activities. And finally, if it is needed, we would like to create new opportunities for fulfilling these goals. Um, we have uh, 11 uh, names here uh, as members of the ACM Euro Prize. Uh, we, have, we have very good coverage uh, in terms of gender, geography, and uh, technical coverage, but we would like to become more. Uh, so I would like to invite you, if, if you would like to get involved, please send me an email. And uh, let me also say that uh, uh, we would like to know uh, what are the expectations that you have from the Council. Uh, we would like to receive your feedback. Um, there are many questions that we don't know what is the full answer. And uh, I think uh, your feedback in this direction would be valuable. For instance, uh, uh, what are the needs, as I said, of the community? Uh, what other things we need to do for you, you would like us to do for, for the community? Uh, how we can best uh, contact you and come in touch with you? So please send us your comments and suggestions regarding our activities. Uh, moreover, in order to contribute to our goals, um, please consider your nomination to the ACM member, uh, advanced member grades and awards. And if you're an ACM fellow already, consider acting as a nominator yourself. You may remember 
when the time came to become an ACM fellow, to get nominated uh, for becoming an ACM fellow, how you were feeling, and uh, it would be nice if you can now contribute the in uh, um, providing this opportunity to more more uh, less senior colleagues of, of, of yours. Uh, um, the council and the members of RISE would like to acknowledge that uh, the future of the council depends, of course, on creating trust with you, with our community, and uh, we would like to persuade you to contribute to our efforts and our activities. This can be by increasing your participation in uh, some of these activities uh, through the ACM awards and member grades, for instance, uh, through volunteering opportunities, through providing feedback, the best way that uh, the any way that best fits to, to you. Uh, we are eager to hear your opinion and to engage your ideas in our activities. So your opinion does matter. And uh, we are gonna have discussion sections, right, uh, sessions right after, uh, but also we are gonna have a Google form at the end of the webinar where you can provide your feedback offline even after the end of the event. Thank you very much. Uh, Gabriel and I would be happy to answer your questions. And you can find more information about the Council and RISE under these URLs. OK, thank you, Panayota. Um, we're going to take uh, maybe a minute or two for, for questions. There is no open question there. There was a question about uh, um, the open access to the, to the digital library, but it was answered uh, uh, online, uh, saying that it will be retroactive. Um, uh, maybe just a quick question to, to you, Yula, if uh, people are interested in, uh, uh, you know, becoming uh, more active in, in ACM Europe, uh, what's, what's the path? Well, actually, all the committees have uh, provided, uh, well, ACM Europe TPC, for instance, has an open call for uh, the four, uh, there are four areas that, that they work on, these four areas uh, are security and privacy of smart cities, IT in the light of climate change, uh, artificial intelligence and autonomous systems. And there is an open call for people to contribute to these 20 of these areas. So if you are interested, please send a message to the chair of the, of the committee, which is Chris Hankin, but you can find all this information on the website of the, of the council. Uh, the um, ACMW Europe also has uh, open volunteering opportunities. For ACM Europe Prize, please send a message to me and um, tell me what exactly would uh, you would like to, to contribute and um, we have we are going to have external collaborators and we are discussing how we are going to become uh, uh, be bigger the working teams and you are very welcome to contribute in any of the goals that I described uh, in general um, all of our committees uh, um, are open to collaboration with the community. And uh, if uh, you have ideas or if you want to contribute, please contact the chairs. OK, thank you. Um, so there is a question about uh, um, uh, different grades, but I think this will be answered in, in what's coming up in the panel. So uh, well, hold this for, for later. Um, just uh, I would like to ask a quick question to Gabriele. Um, since you are European, and uh, I, I think there has been maybe two European presidents of ACM, at least in recent history, are you experiencing a, a culture shock <laughs> becoming president of a, an organization that is often viewed as a, a more American-centric or North American-centric? Or many people think the A in ACM is America, but it's not. <laughs> so I don't know if you have a few comments on this. Yeah, no, no, it definitely was not a cultural shock. Um, what, what I truly hope is that we will overcome actually those those regional borders because we are all ACM and we all contribute to that. And that's always the spirit that I would like to bring in our meetings. I have to admit that in the past, I once have been attending an ACM meeting where statistics have been presented and it was two columns for the US and for the rest of the world. And I complained a little bit about that. But I would say that this perspective definitely is, is outdated, it's, it's no longer there. Um, and, and we have to, to act globally, all of us have to act globally because we have to solve global problems. And if we don't unite our forces and don't work together, still of course, considering cultural differences, there are specifics, we are not all equal, but we, serve, we deserve all to have equal rights and being equally treated. I think that's, that's the critical point, uh, the main challenge here. And this not only relates to computer science, this relates to, to our society in, in general. So, um, yeah, I think actually ACM is in a strong position because of this global membership 
and um, yeah, the, the, I also would like to, to mention one specific problem. We do have recently founded the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Council, which specifically looks at those kind of issues and really tries when, for example, people for committees or boards or councils are nominated to have a true diverse um, setting. The problem is, if you really consider diversity at its core, diversity with respect to gender, with respect to region, and there may be even other aspects, then each committee probably would have need to have 1,000 members. So it's not always possible to achieve, of course, full diversity, but um, we, I think we are on, on a good path and yeah, we are making progress. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Gabriela. Thank you, uh, Anayota. Um, we're going to move on to the uh, well, the core topic of, of today's webinar. Uh, and so I'm going to give the floor to Valérie Sarny, uh, who will introduce uh, herself and, and the panel and then moderate the, the discussion. Uh, so uh, thanks again, Gabriela and uh, Anayota. And uh, 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 the floor is yours, Valérie. Thank you, Michel. So yeah, I, so I'm Valérie Sarny, Director of Research at INRIA Paris, so in France. Uh, I am also a member of the SCM European Council, and I am a member of the RAIS Working Group. So it is my pleasure to, you know, to share this uh, session on the member grades and SCM awards. So this is going to be a three steps uh, session. First, we will have a presentation of the member grades and ACM Awards. Then we will have the panel with discussion, which will be moderated by Panayota. And then we will have a Q&A. So first, before introducing everybody, I would like to thank very much the participants from the US because we know that for some of them, it's very early. So thank you for, for uh, participating and especially the panelists. So uh, the panelists are, Jim Narus, uh, who is chair of the SEM Fellows Committee, Roy Levin, who is co chair of the SEM Awards Committee, John R. White, who is co chair of the SEM Awards Committee, so with Roy, and Nuria Oliver, who is member of the SEM Fellows Committee, Geraldine Fitzpatrick, who is member of SEM Distinguished Member Committee, and finally Anastasia Elim Elamaki, sorry, Anastasia, who is chair of the SEM European. Fellows coming, working group, sorry. So as I said, we are going to start with the, the presentation of the uh, SEM Fellows and uh, SEM Awards. So first, Jim, thank you for presenting, introducing the SEM member grades, if you can now. So sorry to say that you have three minutes for introducing because we, we are short on time for everything. So Jim, the floor is yours for the presentation of the SEM member grades. Thank you. Okay, so let's start. Let's start at the top. So the the top is obviously ACM fellows. Um, I'm not sure if it's written down anywhere, but nominally this is the top one percent of the ACM members. In reality, it's not the top one percent. As Gabriel said, ACM is about a hundred thousand members, and it's been that way for for a long time. Um, I just looked, there are 1,316, so we've exceeded the limit. So unless we sit around and wait for people to die, which we're not going to do, we're gonna keep nominating more fellows and the number is gonna go up. So conceptually, it's the top 1% of the, the members. In practice, it's uh, more than that. And I think that's, that's quite correct. Um, the sort of next, level below that is the distinguished uh, members. And again, this is uh, a, a group that's supposed to be um, distinguished. I don't know what the numerical uh, sort of where it should be. I don't know if there is one. Uh, Roy and John, you could help me if, if, if I've missed something there. Um, Again, it's supposed to be people who have some seniority who have been uh, in their profession, either academic or professional for a number of years and have accomplishments, but perhaps not the sort of level of accomplishments that would enable them to rise to the level of uh, ACM fellow. 
And uh, did, did I miss anything? I think I, I got that, John, uh, Roy? No, I think that's yeah. a good summary. I, I would simply add that when these programs were set up, as you mentioned, the goal for fellows was around 1% of the, of the membership. The goals for distinguished member was around 10% of the membership and the goals for senior member were around 25% or something like that. Okay. Okay, so Jim, thank you. I believe you introduced everything. So thank you. So now, now I'm going to leave the floor, sorry to Roy and John so that they uh, give introduction to the SEM awards, uh, which is the other uh, challenging applications for European in general. So if you could present this in about eight minutes. So thank you. Sure. Um, hi, John White here. And Roy and I will split the eight minutes. <laughs> um, I'll say a few words about the origins of the awards program and its scope. And I think Roy will focus a little bit on some of the operational aspects that um, everyone should be aware of. The ACM awards program is a big deal within ACM and it goes back to the very first award created by ACM, which was the Turing Award in 1966. Uh, so there's been 55 years of the ACM awards program. It has three major components. Um, there are ACM level awards of which there are 20 plus of those. There are SIG level awards or SIG awards, and there are hundreds of those. And then there are the advanced member grades that uh, Jim was just discussing. Officially advanced member grades are not awards, they are member grades, um, but they are managed under the uh, awards program because building the committees and running the processes are very much like running award processes. Um, so as I mentioned, there's 20 plus ACM awards. Uh, ACM has 36 SIGs. Each of those SIGs offers somewhere at a minimum two awards. SIG plan on the other hand has 12 awards. So there are close to um, 150, 180 SIG level awards. And then there are of course advanced member grades. So, you know, taken together, we're looking at 200 awards annually from the ACM. Um, the effort to decide these awards involves hundreds of volunteers. What Roy and I do is we manage the ACM awards committees and the committees that decide the advanced member grades. And then we oversee what the SIGs are doing. So we have to approve new awards, but uh, the SIGs set up their own committees and run their processes. Um, but like I said, the awards program is big, it's visible, like when the Turing Award is announced each year, it receives significant worldwide press, which is a great thing for both uh, the award winner or winners, it's a great thing for ACM. Um, and as I said, just in terms of scope, hundreds of awards, hundreds of volunteers on awards committees, uh, and of course, therefore, hundreds and hundreds of nominations uh, across the spectrum that have to be uh, received, sorted, evaluated, and decided. Uh, so how does all of this work, you might ask? And I think Roy can help us understand that a little bit. Thank you, John. Um, in three minutes, I don't think I can tell you how it all works. <laughs> but let me just give you a couple of numbers that sort of flesh out what John had said. Um, if you look at the uh, committees for ACM awards, and you focus on the committees that are completely staffed by uh, ACM members, we have some committees that are joint with other organizations like IEEE. Uh, there are about seven of those. There are approximately 20 that are ACM only. Um, and collectively, these committees comprise about 120 members of ACM. You have to be an ACM member to be on one of these committees. Um, the terms vary, but they tend to be a few years each. So if you uh, do the arithmetic, you see that 30 to 40 committee positions turn over every year. That's a lot of volunteers for us to identify and to bring to the committee. <clears throat> and of course, we aren't just looking for people who are qualified in terms of the technical nature of the awards. We're looking, as Gabrielle mentioned, to emphasize diversity across various dimensions. Um, 
And in particular, the ones that we tend to focus on are gender, geography, and the type of institution that people are from, whether it's academia, industry, government, and so on. Um, just to give you a sense of how that goes, um, once again, you can't get this level of diversity evened out across each of these committees. Some of them only have four people. But if you look in aggregate, <clears throat> we see that um, we're doing pretty well when it comes to um, gender. Uh, we have uh, something like 36% women on these committees. If you look at ACM membership worldwide, uh, it's about 12%. So the, I think we've done pretty well there. Um, if you look at um, geographical representation, um, about half the members of uh, professional members of ACM are in North America, uh, about another 20% or so in Europe, um, and the remainder in Asia and other parts of the world. Um, Europe is represented at about the 23% level on our committee. So again, pretty close to its representation within ACM. Um, Academia, if you look along the dimension of institutions, uh, is probably somewhat overrepresented. Uh, we have about equal numbers of professional members um, that come from industry or practitioners, excuse me, industry or academia. And, uh, but obviously we're a bit skewed uh, at the moment towards academia. So that's probably something we wanna work towards um, in the future, as well as better proportional representation for some of the other regions of the world. Um, the last thing I want to say is that, um, as John said, there are hundreds and hundreds of nominations, but that doesn't mean that every committee is overwhelmed with nominations. Indeed, getting nominations is one of the, the chief problems that as an organization we face. And my point here, and we'll talk about it more later, is that in some sense, it's, it's everybody's job to do that. The committees try to, to source nominations as well, noting where there might be cases where they want to encourage a nomination, um, which is, of course, not the same as guaranteeing that the award will be given. Um, but also that this is a regional activity as well. And so we're very glad to hear that, that ACM Europe is worried about this problem um, of how to get more nominations uh, from Europe. And we want to do whatever we can to help with that. I'll stop there. We'll deal with some more of this later in the session. Okay, thank you very much. So we, we are going to, to go to the panel part of the session. And so let me stress that after the panel, there will be, well, now, sorry, there will be Q&A uh, by Panayota, but then uh, please participants, feel free to add questions in the Q&A box. Um, I see that you are kind of shy so far. So please, I'm sure you have plenty of questions so please start asking them. But Panayota first, uh, go with your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. So I would like to start by giving, uh, by saying a few words about what is the goal of answering the question, what is the goal of the webinar? The main goal is to inform you, the participants, about the ACM member grades and awards. And we would like to answer questions like how to prepare a successful nomination, how to write a strong endorsement letter, how to choose, to choose your endorsers. Uh, um, but on the other hand, we would also like to give you the chance to communicate directly with the chairs of the ACM awards and member grades committees, and also other members of these committees that are located in Europe. Uh, it is very important for us to receive your feedback. We would like to understand the kind of support you would like to have in order to become more actively involved in this ACM program. So please use the Q&A and also the feedback for Google form that will be provided to you at the end to give us feedback and let us know what exactly you would like to to get from us, what, what you expect from the from the from the eyes and the council to do. Uh, I am uh, really proud to have uh, um, to, to introduce uh, the panel members to you. Uh, we have uh, the chair of the ACM Fellows Committee, Jim Jim Larus. Uh, we have the two co-chairs of the ACM Awards Committees, Roy Levin and uh, John White. Uh, we have Nuria Oliver, who is a member of uh, ACM Fellows Committee uh, located in Spain. Uh, we 
have uh, a member of the ACM Distinguished Member Committee, Geraldine Fitzpatrick, who is located in Austria, and Anastasia Ilamaki, who is the chair of uh, the ACM Europe Fellows Working Group. Um, of course, uh, a big thanks goes to all for being here today with us, and especially to Roy, as Valerie said, uh, who lives in the Bay Area, and it is very early in the morning there. So now I think it's time to open the panel. Uh, John, let me start with you. Uh, what do you think are the most important parameters on which the success of the nomination depends? Uh, by far the most success, I mean, the most important parameter is the, is the nomination itself. Uh, the nominate, no, there is a nominator. Uh, the nominator writes an overview of a case for giving the award to the individual that's being nominated. And then the nominator seeks um, endorsements for that nomination. At the end of the day, each awards committee basically makes their decisions based on the nomination sitting in front of them. And if there is a weakness in nominations, and I think when what I've seen, there's a little bit more of this coming from Europe than from the US, I might be wrong. But the weakness is um, assuming everyone on the committee already knows the individual being nominated, knows their accomplishments. So if the nominator or the endorsers don't actually spell out what the accomplishment was and is and what the impact has been, and the endorsers verify that, then it's a weak nomination. And even though the individual's accomplishments might be fabulous, unless they're spelled out in the nomination, there's a, there's not, there's a good chance it will not succeed. I see. Thank you very much. So, Tim, would you like to also contribute to this question? Could you please provide some advice and tips for preparing a successful nomination? Um, first, let me just agree 100% with uh, what John just said. Um, you know, right now we have 153 nominees for fellow and I'm plowing through them. I read about 20% of them. And, you know, what you, what you see is a lot of really good people who probably are not going to make it because the nomination is not as good as they are. Um, and, you know, it's, it happens. But let me just sort of uh, explain the way I view the world. And I, I should point out that this is done by a committee. So what I say is my point of view, we argue about this every year uh, in the committee. But, you know, there are different types of nominations. So academic nominations are the predominant uh, type of nominations. Um, and there, you know, it's really easy to identify the criteria, which is research impact. You know, the papers that you've published, the impact you've had on your field, the follow on work, the impact on industry and so forth. We all know what the formula is. Um, my suggestion is if you're writing a nomination, do not spend a long time listing all of the normal academic service roles, like you are on this program committee, you are the associate editor of this journal. Everybody has it, uh, you know, it just clutters up the nomination and waste space. Um, what you need to do is you need to call out things that are exceptional because we're interested in the top 1%. We're not interested in the normal behavior of academics, which is to do lots of things. So you got to identify what is exceptional in terms of their research, in terms of their service, because we're not just interested in research. There are people who get fellow for service, and that could very well be service to an academic community. It could be service to a much larger community uh, outside of academia. Um, second large group is industry. And industry tends to be people that have contact with research. So you can imagine the sort of companies that have sort of research and industry uh, collaborations, because those people are more aware of ACM and more aware of this awards. And so they're in contact with the research community and it's easier to write these awards. They're very different though, because what you may get the award for is not necessarily publications, but it's what you've built and the impact on the industry as a whole. Um, the danger there is that people tend to write very, very company centric uh, nominations, which are uh, unparsable by the people on the outside. So you've got to be aware of that. Um, and then the third thing is literally service. There are people who don't necessarily have the most distinguished academic career and didn't necessarily write a piece of software or build a system, 
but have done a tremendous amount for the community. And there can be extremely strong nominations in that group, and every year there are. But you know, in all three of these categories, what I beg of you to do is to tell us on the committee what is important and why it's important, and don't assume that we know it. Right? We have 11 people on the committee. We don't cover all of the areas of computer science. We don't know the people firsthand. Everyone is going to be, every nomination is going to be read by uh, at least three and up to five different people on the committee. So there are not going to be experts reading this. And so you need to tell us what is important. And you need to tell us specifically. You can't just say so and so is a great researcher and has published great papers in the area. That doesn't help, right? You need to tell us why the papers are great and what the impact and the value of the papers are. And if you can do that, you can write a successful nomination. So, Could I add one other comment? Um, I think it's when you, in particular with the fellows, there's a distinction between the nomination that is written by the nominator and the endorsements that support that nomination. And I think one of the things that can make a nomination weak is if the endorsers just essentially repeat the nomination. What you want endorsers to do is to verify and attest to the impact that the work that's being nominated has had. They don't have to attest to all of it, but to at least some of it. And then if you have five endorsers, it sort of proves the reality that this work did indeed have impact, which is an important um, criteria for attaining fellow. Um, I will second that, um, you know, in reading again this year, there have been a number of nominations where I was very skeptical after reading the nomination, but it totally changed my view after reading endorsements from people who genuinely knew the work, had followed on the work, and could explain the significance of the work. And the nomination typically doesn't go into that depth because it's trying to cover the entire career. And the opportunity is to make the impact much clearer in these letters uh, from people who really know the work. And if they just sort of say the same thing as the nomination, which some of them do, um, it's not very helpful. So John's absolutely Thank right. You. Thank you very much. That was very informative, I think. And uh, especially what you mentioned towards the end is, rel is relevant to my next question to Roy, um, who is, um, uh, the role of the endorsement letters. Uh, we all know that uh, the role of the endorsement letters is very significant. Uh, and um, so my question is, uh, how can one prepare a, a strong endorsement letter? What kind of information should be provided in it? And I think the previous uh, John and, and the team have already covered partly this question, but do you want to add something, Roy? Yes, I think uh, I think what John and Jim said is, is the, the chief thing that people need to know um, what I would say is that this really has an implication for how endorsers are chosen, because uh, obviously you want people who can speak to the material in the in the nomination from firsthand knowledge. So the selection of an endorsers is obviously important too. You know, getting an endorsement letter from someone who doesn't really know the person being nominated has no value to the committee. Um, so it should be, people obviously think about who should be the nominator, but it's equally important to think about who the endorsers should be. Uh, with, with respect to the details of the endorsement letter, fortunately, we actually have a document um, on the ACM website that is quite useful in spelling out the kinds of detail that should be in an endorsement letter, in, and in fact, in a nomination as well. And I'll mention it here, and perhaps we can send out the, the link to it as well. Um, it's called an informal guide to ACM fellow nominations, but in fact, most of it applies to all member grades involving endorsement and indeed to, to nominations for awards as well. So I would encourage people to look at that. It's got a, a lot of specific do's and, and don'ts. Thank you very much. It is indeed a great document and it would be great if we uh, forward the link to all the participants. Uh, so Geraldine, may I ask you to contribute to this question as well? Uh, yes. So are there ways that the nominees could help in this process or, or not? They shouldn't. But I, I would 
I would echo everything that's been said both about a lot of what was said about the um, nominators also applies to the endorsers. And I think that the, the powerful endorsement letters are the ones that tell the stories. You know, like uh, Roy said about not just repeating the CV or repeating what's in the nom nomination letter. And it doesn't matter even if the person is a fellow, if they do something that's very generic and say, yeah, I, you know, I approve or I agree, it doesn't carry any weight. And so it's more important that it really is someone who can tell specific concrete stories to illustrate the impact um, and to recognize that their letter complements the nomination letter. And I think that's something that took me a while to personally understand in the process uh, before being on the committee. The other thing that I think is really important within the European context is that we take care, and even perhaps within our uh, sub-SIG areas, is that we take care to contextualize the culture in which we're talking about. So someone just talked about um, saying, you know, like saying it, why something that was done in industry uh, was relevant, because often if it's too uh, industry centric, you know, or company centric, it doesn't make sense. And I think we shouldn't be assuming that people understand the significance of, say, a national uh, Austrian award or a national Dutch award in computer science. So it's one thing telling us that they've got an award, you know, a national Dutch award or something in something, but tell us how significant that is in that context, like are 50 given out or is this one selected from, you know, like a small pool, you know, so help, help the reviewers interpret the significance of it. The other point I'd make is to be very clear which criteria you are really arguing significance for. Because sometimes in, in people trying to be very general and saying, oh yeah, they're wonderful, you're not sure what other two criteria at least that you think they're really, you know, um, arguing that this person meets the criteria on. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this clarifies a lot uh, how uh, a successful endorsement letter is going to be written. Thank you all. Uh, Nuria, may I continue with you? Uh, motivating people to act as nominators is not always an easy task. However, we, we often hear from European researchers that, that they feel ready to get nominated, but they don't know exactly how to initiate the process or even what the process should be, what, what exactly they should do to initiate the process. Do you have any piece of advice for them? What should be the involvement of the nominees to the nomination process? And what motivates people to act as nominators? Yeah, so I think that's a very important question because we have been emphasizing so far how important the nominator is and how important the nomination is to really make the case. So I think the first um, important observation is indeed um, how to choose the nominator. And I think it's evident that it has to be someone that knows the work of the person really well and that really can make uh, an informed uh, um, uh, statement about the significance of that work, uh, as opposed to just listing, you know, as uh, Jim was mentioning, you know, publications or service, you know, activities. I think it has to be someone that, that shows us a certain level of depth in the knowledge of the work. So usually it could be um, the PhD advisor, or it could be um, as a more senior colleague that has collaborated very closely with the person or something like that. Um, it is a somewhat um, involved uh, task because the nominator not only has to write the nomination, uh, but also has to identify the endorsers, which uh, are also very important. So in that process, uh, you, I, I would imagine usually nominees uh, suggest um, uh, endor potential endorsers to the nominator uh, because the nominees know who knows their work really well and, and who could uh, write um, sort of like a, an assessment of their work that goes beyond you know, reporting what they have done on paper. Um, at the same time, nominators are usually very busy people because they tend to be uh, recognized as successful uh, individuals. So um, sometimes the nominators might ask the nominees to 
um, help them figure out what they need to do to write the nomination and to be on top of the dates because you know they don't want to miss the deadlines and things like that. So the nominees, uh, um, you know, might have to play a role. Excuse me. Uh, and there was some background noise. Uh, sorry, I don't know if you could hear it. Um, so, um, uh, so I think the nominee definitely might need to send reminders to the nominator about the various deadlines, you know, be on top of making sure that all the endorsers, you know, are um, confirmed. And I think it depends on the nominator, whether the nominator would need additional information or not from the nominee. Um, ideally, the nominator is someone who knows really well the work of the nominee and would be able to write the nomination, you know, by themselves, but that's not always the case. And of course, the, the, before any of this, uh, the question is, how do you get nominated by someone? And uh, there, I think it's important um, that people maybe are a little bit proactive. And I think you showed the statistics earlier when you were encouraging people to, um, to apply for the awards and how, uh, how much of a positive impact that had. So I would like to encourage um, you know, scientists or computer scientists who have who consider have had some significant impact to really um, think about, um, you know, if they if they think they would qualify to, to to explore options in terms who might be a good nominator for them, and maybe have a conversation with the nominator, you know, as to whether they would be willing to nominate the person. Um, I think there has to be a certain level of uh, proactivity from the nominee in in I mean in in many cases. Uh, because maybe because nominators are very busy people and you know they might not have the time but it depends a lot on the institution i think on academic institutions many times um more senior professors um, um are already sort of like it's prestigious for an institution to have acm fellows or acm distinguished scientists so there's also an, an active role of the more senior individuals to um to give visibility to the talent that they have, you know, in their institutions and sort of, sort of like support them. So I think it's a mixture of people reaching out to potential nominators and exploring whether they think they're ready and then uh, nominators themselves looking into their departments or their, ne their network and seeing, you know, if they can nominate someone. Um, I do think there is a gender difference though in the proactivity. I think, um, women tend to be less proactive than men in seeking out uh, nominators. So I think a very important message is to really encourage women to uh, maybe be a little bit more proactive. And, um, and if they think that they, they would qualify to have a conversation with someone that knows their work really well and explore the possibility that they might nominate them. And I think this is important because we need more diversity in the um, awardees, you know, we need more women to be ACM fellows and ACM distinguished scientists. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that was really great. So Anastasia, would you like to provide your own view on this question? And also you have been the chair of the ACM Europe Fellows Working Group doing uh, excellent work on uh, increasing the numbers of uh, nominations from Europe for ACM Fellows and uh, distinguished members. So what kind of actions do you think uh, the working groups and the council could do to better motivate people to act as nominators? Uh, and also, for instance, these actions could be to come up with lists of people, of senior people who could act as nominators or come in touch with uh, the departments and uh, try to motivate motivate them to nominate their faculty members and you may have other suggestions as well. So um, I guess there's some ways to, uh, I guess in a lot of, um, of these questions, uh, Nuria already gave uh, um, the perspective that I was going to give, but um, there are a few more things to say. In my mind, uh, first of all, the group, the way that we work is that um, we are trying to find uh, in direct or indirect or in indirect ways. Uh, we're trying to find um, worthy European or Europe-based um, researchers who should be um, nominated and would qualify as fellows, but um, they just, you know, for, for one reason or other, they didn't, they haven't 
been nominated so far. And then we we try to find the right people to nominate them. So it's more of an enabling group. Um, we take action also when needed. We mediate quite a bit. Uh, we look through lists of people, lists of awardees from important awards, lists uh, of ERC, you know, advanced awards, or you know, we have a, a broad spectrum of trying to um, make people more aware of um, of this of the of the fellow grade, uh, make people more aware of the different member grades because there's also a lot of misconceptions, right? Some people, for example, it, it was brought to my attention that some people thought that distinguished member is a consolation prize for 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 fellow, which is so not the case, right? So we try to clear up these things and also make people aware of ACM. You know, it was unbelievable to me, but there were a lot of people who weren't even members. Uh, of ACM, but could be really nominated as fellows at the time of their career that we were uh, put in contact with them. So um, for as a nominee, I think if um, one decides that they should look into this in, in the nomination for themselves, they should first um, do a little bit of research to see in their area who else has been um, a successful, has had a successful nomination as a fellow. Not that there is any way to compare one's lifetime work with somebody else's, right? This is this is really not. But just to get a good feeling as to um, what would be the claim to fame, right? In their domain, like if if I was nominated myself, what would be my first sentence in that nomination as to why I deserve this? And there, it's not a matter of being arrogant or being timid. It's a matter of being realistic. Because uh, this is a, a vehicle for for us to learn about each other, right? For people to learn from others and about other people's work. So that's the first thing. So about you know nominating, you know thinking about putting um, oneself up for nomination as a nominator. Um, I think then they can they can ask a nominator. Uh, I think there was a question that I by mistake pushed an answer live, so now I have to answer it. Um, as a nominator, uh, as a nominee, one can ask a nominator from their own institution to to just do the honors. That's not um, an issue, but it's the endorsers need to be from a different institution because um, that way, obviously, as uh, Jim said, it's a lot more impactful and um, it's very important. And I cannot stress this enough that each endorser gives their own perspective as to why this nomination should go through and why they're putting their time into um, endorsing this nomination. This is the, uh, probably the, one of the most important things said today, and uh, so um, uh, you know. And then, and then, um, as for um, there are a number of questions about uh, requirements, formal requirements for eligibility that obviously vary from a grade to another, and even vary from one society to another. But for that, um, you know, we, I think that uh, we have to work with whatever we have right now. And then the input, I think, of the community is extremely important for people to revise the rules. From personal experience, last year, I was complaining so much about the requirement of five consecutive years as an ACM member right before the nomination to Pat. Ryan, um, and then Pat gave me the news that they lifted the consecutive uh, service requirements of last year. Uh, as of year, we actually had nominations of people who had five years collective, you know, um, uh, membership uh, to ACM, although it wasn't consecutive. The only um, uh, important part is that they should be members when the nomination happens. Um, I think that I've answered Great. everything. Yeah, very interesting information. Thank you very much. We will return to you for a, a next question soon. Um, so I, I think that at this point uh, we have provided a lot of information on 
how uh, we, we, somebody has could write a strong nomination and uh, uh, how a, a, an endorsement letter could be strong, uh, how you choose endorsers and uh, choose your nominator, etc. and very nice advices and all these very nice tips. Um, so I'm going to move on to talking about cultural issues a little bit. Um, Jim, I will start with you. Um, you have spent big periods of time in both sides of the Atlantic. Atlantic. Uh, is the culture in Europe regarding KCM honors and awards different than in the US? And if yes, if you think that the answer is yes, what, what do you think is different and what are the potential reasons for this difference? So I'm going to take a controversial position that uh, maybe Gabriel, Gabriel is not going to like very much, but I actually don't think the culture is different. You know, we see lots of people being uh, nominated from Europe who have a long list of awards that are European awards attached to their CVs. Um, so there's no, there seems like there's a culture of recognizing excellence in Europe with all sorts of awards. I think the problem is ACM, not the nomination process in Europe. I think that you know ACM is viewed as an American-centric institution, and with good reason, as an American who's in Europe, I've sort of seen it firsthand. And I think that a lot of people just don't even sort of think about ACM either joining or being nominated for an award. And I think it's a mistake because ACM is the computer science organization that has global reach. And these awards really do mean something, you know, being in the top 1% of ACM members or top 1.1% of ACM members really is a significant recognition. And so people should sort of try to think of ACM as more of a global organization and consider it as a prestigious award, an award that they would be happy to have along with the European awards that are, that are also on their, their CV. And I think that would be the biggest shift is that if there was a recognition of ACM as a worldwide organization, as a European organization, the nomination question would go away. And a lot of this discussion would be, you know, how do I get uh, an award as opposed to how do we get more nominations for the award? Thank you very much. That's a very interesting uh, position in, uh, because, you know, we often hear uh, from Europeans uh, that uh, they would like to, they are ready for an award, but uh, they don't uh, actually see what is going to be the benefit or whatever, just because, uh, you know, for the promotion, it's not always that, uh, or even the member grades. Uh, thus, yeah, but I don't, I, I agree with you that it's a shift, uh, uh, the kind of shift that you described. So, Nuria, would you like to provide your own, own view on this question? Um, what do you think that uh, could be done to make Europeans more proactive in claiming uh, whatever recognition they deserve through these uh, ACM awards and member grades programs? Well, I mean, I, I agree with, uh, with Jim in that I, I used to live in the US and then I moved to Europe. And I, and I do think that the ACM is um, considered more of an American uh, association by Europeans. Um, so there is an opportunity of growth um, from the part of the ACM to be recognized as a global um, association, not, not a US centric or US dominated you know, association. Then there is the factor that you mentioned in Europe, um, there are very, uh, not, a lot, not everywhere in Europe, but in many countries in Europe, there are predefined um, uh, success metrics or KPIs that are established to determine if a person is going to be promoted to the next level in the academic career. And these kinds of recognitions are usually not included. In fact, there is a very old fashioned uh, approach which does not really even apply to computer science because in many countries like in Spain, uh, conference papers are not even considered at uh, the same level as journal papers, even though in computer science, you know, the, the most prestigious publications are in conferences, right? And everything moves really quickly. So this, the reviewing cycles in conferences tend to be faster. So I think there is also possibly the incentive um, that in many European institutions is it, kind of irrelevant to, to be an ACM fellow. Maybe if they included it as one of the criteria to be promoted for tenure, we probably will get a lot more people applying for um, ACM fellow. So there might be also this element. 
I think in the US, um, there isn't such rigidity in, in, uh, in many ways in the, in the evaluations for tenure. Um, and I think all these kinds of awards and recognitions are taken into consideration. But I mean, I, I do know a little bit about the Spanish system and it's very rigid. Um, there is just a list of things that they care about and everything else is not even, you, you don't even have a place where to put it in the form, so to say. So it's completely irrelevant. So there might be also this, uh, uh, this element. And finally, I mean, I think as we increase the number of uh, ACM fellows and ACM distinguished scientists that are European, I think we will also see uh, more Europeans uh, being nominated and being awarded. Uh, I think there might be also um, a phenomenon of critical mass. And you showed the table earlier when there was a big increase in the number of European um, uh, nominations and also awards, right? So I think if we continue increasing, um, we will see uh, more Europeans being part of this um, distinguished sort of like uh, memberships, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, so Roy, let me come back to you. Um, are there specific evaluation criteria? And um, if yes, so what are these evaluation criteria? And uh, are there criteria on which European researchers fail more often and they have to be more careful? For instance, uh, um, this may have to do with the endorsement letters or whether the endorsement letters arrive or I don't know other, other parameters that we cannot imagine and you are aware of. So I would say that <clears throat> the evaluation criteria are pretty well spelled out on a per award basis on the web pages. Um, so I think, if, yes, they're necessarily general in some cases, but um, obviously nominations and, and endorsements that speak to those criteria are important to do. Um, I wouldn't say we've collected statistics in a formal way about uh, failure rates or what goes wrong, but we can look at overall numbers and see that uh, nominations succeed at about the same rate from Europe as they do elsewhere in the world. So I don't see any systemic issues there. Um, I think that uh, if there is a if there is an issue, it's the lack of nominations um, that happens. And this is particularly true for if you look at the numbers for distinguished member, which is the middle of the three advanced grades. You know, for senior member, it's a self-nomination process, and you had great uh, success in promoting that a, a year ago uh, and getting the numbers up on that. Um, distinguished member, the bar is a bit higher. And uh, for that, you, you uh, don't self-nominate. Um, so uh, if we look at the numbers there, we see fewer uh, on a sort of participation rate uh, basis than in the US or, or the world generally. Um, not so for fellow, in, in, incidentally. So it really is in the middle category uh, that, it, that, it's, uh, that it's different. Um, so that's where I would say if there is a, if there is a, I wouldn't call that a failure of the same sort that perhaps you were alluding to. It's a, simply a failure to submit. Um, and that would be a, a great place to invest some effort in, in improving things. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's very useful to know this and for the, all the people who participate to hear this. Uh, so John, would you like to add something in this direction? I think we have seen the numbers, uh, you and I and uh, the members of ICE, uh, and we know that the success rate is more or less similar to that for the US, as Roy just said, and therefore Europeans, when they try, they do succeed at a rate similar as their US colleagues. Uh, so in, in, in order to, to improve the participation rate, do you have any advice uh, on, on this, how to to how to improve the participation rate, or do you have anything to add? Just feel free. I think um, a lot of the important points have been covered uh, in multiple dimensions. Uh, when you, but when you do take note of the fact that the acceptance rates for at least the advanced member grades are about the same between European nominations and North American nominations, you know. What does that leave you with in terms of um, seeing more of more of Europe appear in 
the fellows list or in ACM awards. And uh, I mean, part of it is getting nominations. That's important. I mean, the other part I think is increasing the number of members of ACM in Europe. Uh, I think what you see in the awards program reflects sort of the size of the population that you are trying to recognize. And so I believe the more members we have in Europe, uh, the knock-on effect will be more advanced member grades and more recognition with ACM awards. Yeah, thank you. This is a very valid point. And actually, we try to find some statistics on what is the IT percentage of what Europe contributes to the IT percentage of the world to see whether the 20% that you mentioned previously is more or less what we would what we should expect. But uh, we have not gone that, that, that far in this direction and we need to study it more. So thank you very much. So Anastasia, let me go back to you. Um, we often hear that it would be helpful if the evaluation committee provides an evaluation report to nominators for their nominations. We also hear that some statistics per country or providing nicknames per country uh, might also, and some indicators could also be useful for researchers to reach decisions on whether they are ready to be nominated or not, and for which uh, level, member grade, for which member grade. So, I don't know if all these are practical <laughs> or not, but uh, what kind of support do you think researchers require in order to become more active in nominations? And what do you think uh, could be doable and practical to accomplish? So, um, yeah, that's a great question because I mean, I think I addressed a similar question before, but it was a top down addressing. So I think here we can go bottom, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was a bottom up approach and here we can go top down. So I think the support is something that comes from top uh, as it is, as was mentioned before, I forget where, the, that um, universities organizations really are, um, should be or are or should be anyway looking to in, Increase the number of um, people in their groups with higher uh, member grades that have high, hold higher member grades and uh, especially fellows um, at ACM. Uh, and this actually is a point for uh, to, to go after. Um, it's very important that uh, we educate uh, all about all this information that was said today, even I, uh, who and I have been reading and working on it just to put together the group and, and make our work impactful. And still, even I was actually educated today by some things that were said that just didn't click when I read them, I guess, um, or some information from people's experience. So it's very important that we educate uh, deans or presidents of universities or deans or provosts or whoever is responsible that that this is how this is done and it's actually uh, a great thing to start initiatives from within the organization to to find people who could be nominated and find the appropriate nominators as I said before this can be from the same organization so it's not really a problem. Um, Again, I think the biggest issue, especially in Europe, is that people do not know or understand uh, what ACM is. And that is, a, for me, coming, I mean, I'm a European, but I was, uh, I grew up academically in the United States uh, for most of uh, my time as a computer scientist. And it was a huge surprise to me when I came across the fact that you know, people were not even, not even, not only weren't they ACM members, but were like, yeah, I've heard of that ACM, not sure, you know, <laughs> what it is. So um, it's important that, I mean, I don't know how this can be done, to be honest. Um, maybe it's important that uh, this kind of events happen uh, for a school or, or for, for a few departments in, uh, in Europe or for kind of a targeted thing, like an information session uh, for people who really could be helped and supported so as to make this process easier for them because everybody's day has 24 hours and everybody has a day job, right? Um, so this, this should be a top-down process, I think. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, that's very helpful. Geraldine, would you like to contribute to this question? So what kind of support do you think uh, uh, researchers need? Uh, and also, uh, are there, um, what is the differentiation between distinguished members and fellows? And there are some similar questions in the chat, I think. Uh, is there a clear litmus uh, test that shows the difference? We can't hear you, you are muted. Yeah, I'm not very used to using Zoom after so long with COVID. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, the litmus test is hard and I think people have already talked about uh, looking at other people in your area and seeing what awards they have and just seeing how you might sit yourself alongside them is one big litmus test. And uh, the awards, you know, someone asked about can you, you know, can you apply for fellow if you've got a senior or a DM? And yes, you can. You know, like it's, it's, it's not like you get one level and that's it, you've exhausted all your chances. So if you look at the criteria and the wording of the awards, um, they do reflect, I guess, increasing levels of, I don't know, not, not just a, a significance and impact of the work and and that most often comes with sort of age and career path so you would expect younger researchers to apply for senior fellows um you know maybe middle career depending you know for dm and you know and i'm um, not some more senior people or people who really had a significant field changing impact for fellows so you can if you're happy you know there's no strict progression you can apply for dm without being a senior member you can just apply be nominated for a, i mean you can be nominated for dm without being senior member and so on i think for the the issue about what can encourage people I, we've also people have also mentioned things about uh, top down and apart from the leadership of our organizations proactively you know like maybe emailing out to heads of departments and saying who in your faculty can you you know, see fitting these criteria and uh, ways of encouraging them to seek out nominators. Um, I think it would also be good to ex specifically target existing award holders to return this, you know, like the circle of kindness, the, the academic favours, or whatever, and it's not favours, but other people did it for them and, you know, take their turn in doing it for, you know, other colleagues. Um, I think we need a lot of them to be more proactive, but as Anastasia said, every, you know, every, well, Nuria, everyone is really busy. So I know it's challenging, but I think, uh, and rec keeping an eye out for each other, especially women. You know, we've said women are less likely to uh, think of themselves as being ready for nomination at any level. And so, you know, saying to each other, look, you know, have you ever thought about doing this and really encouraging that and, and planting the seed, which is what you're, uh, initiative did a couple of years ago with the senior member you know people haven't thought about it thought about it but we don't have to rely on ACM Europe to do that we can do that in our own circles in our own professional circles in our own faculties among the positive aspects if I may that one can emphasize in such a reach out uh, effort is that I mean there is of course the institutional you know, visibility side and, and all that good stuff that comes with these distinctions and with having people that have these distinctions in the organization and having a large number of them. But also there's the human side, right? This is an, a, nominating someone as, as the moment you start doing that, then you realize that it's a great way to spend your time to write good things about somebody else that you really believe deserves an award. There's really, it's a really, really great experience. Um, and of course, you know, if it gets turned down and fairly often they do, um, that's one thing. But I mean, as, as, as work, it isn't the, you know, the most uh, unpleasant work I've ever had to do. Right? It's, it's actually great, so. Thank you very much all. Uh, we have uh, just a few minutes to go, so I, I will now move on to um, uh,
go through some of the questions. I gave more time to this uh, part of, of, the, of the panel because I saw that uh, you were answering questions as you were going. So we already have eight answered questions from what you have said, but uh, let me uh, go first to the questions and then I will give you one minute to sum up. So I'm going to move this sum and cup session later on. Um, there is a question uh, um, uh, uh, about um, uh, by Monica Hensiger. She says, I understand that it is important to increase the number of nominations. I have served on ACM award committees and I find it is, it is also a problem that the work of non-American computer scientists Artists is not as well known in the US as is the work of Americans. The committees, however, are usually dominated by Americans, thus it is hard for the few non-American committee members as they are in the minority to convince the rest of the committee. Does anybody want to, maybe Jim, would you like to comment on this? Um, I'm not sure I agree with Monica's point of view, at least on the fellows committee. Um, it's pretty much a worldwide uh, pool of research that we're dipping into. And the Europeans participate at the same level. And I think the, the numbers that were cited by either John or Roy is that uh, as the fraction of nominees, the Europeans are carrying their, their weight in terms of being successful. You know, I think that roughly about half of the nominees are successful with the fellows every year. And I think it's true for the overall pool and it's true for the Europeans as well. So I'm not sure I see that uh, happening with the Europeans. I mean, they publish in the same conferences. Um, in general, they are you know, getting nominations that are from people that are all over the world and they're getting endorsements from all over the world. So. It's, maybe it's more of a problem on some of the other committees. I, I haven't really seen that happen too much. John, Roy, do you want to? Yeah, John. I will just, um, I mean, I can understand sort of the, the point that Monica is making in that um, that's one of the reasons Roy and I work really hard to try to get Europeans and non-US um, computer scientists onto award committees. And there are, you know, the fellows committee is one of 20 plus committees we have to keep populated. So there's lots of opportunities. And then, you know, so and that process itself is, you know, finding the people to reach out to in Europe who might say yes, who could bring what we need. Uh, it's an ongoing process. I mean, in a way, Europeans um, as a percentage represent, you know, seem, to represent the European members of ACM, but it doesn't mean that we can't that we have to that we can't stop working on this. We have to keep Europeans on the committees. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think I agree with this. And as I told you in uh, one of our calls, the ACM Europe Council would be very happy to help you in this. And we often hear that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, you are trying to find people from the, from Europe and from other continents outside the US and it's not an easy task. So please feel free to contact the councils and ask them for help if, if you need them. Uh, I, we have another question by Jayan Haritza, who is the president of the ACM in the Council. Uh, I'm going to read it to you. As per the rules of ACM, a higher grade nomination that does not go through in the current year has to be kept in cold storage for two years before the nominee can apply again. There are far too many variables that govern success in a specific year, so requiring can successful nominees to wait for two years before applying often makes them lose interest and not bother trying it again. This has certainly been our experience in India. Therefore, I request that nominations be allowed to be continuously in play for at least two years before the pool of restriction kicks in. Who would like to undertake this question? Roy, would, would you like to say something here? I think it's an interesting idea. I think the reason that these, um, what what is called the cooling off period, if you want to think of it that way, is, is there is simply to manage workload. Um, if every nomination was held over every time, you can imagine what would happen. So it may be that there's a way to tweak this that would make it work a little better. We're certainly open to considering that. And let me just say that this issue, this re requirement is 
just for the fellows nominations. Uh, nominations to all the other ACM awards are frequently held over. No, if it, they're not it's also successful. for the distinguished. It, it is yeah. also for the distinguished members. Yes. But it, yeah, it's for the member grades, but not for all twenty yeah. plus awards. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Okay. So here's another question uh, for senior and distinguished member grades. Can you offer more of a sense of what makes a successful application? Put it differently, any guidance for someone relatively early or mid career to decide when they are ready to apply for these grades? Geraldine, do you like to say something? You're muted. You are Sorry, Will. I was just reading one of the other comments at that time. Can you just quickly repeat that? Yeah, yeah. There is a question by somebody, by an anonymous attendee, that uh, uh, for senior and distinguished member grades, can you offer more of a sense of what makes a successful application? Um, any guidance for someone relatively early or mid career to decide when they are ready to apply for these grades? Yeah. And I, it's, this is really difficult. There's no checklist that says, you know, you've got to have two journal publications and citation count of X. It really is in the details of the arguments. And as we've said in the discussion, I think trying to do the calibration against other people, especially in your field where you may be able to better interpret their achievements and work could be a way to go. Um, and get a sense check from other colleagues, uh, maybe colleagues who already have the award or, or whatever, to you know, get them to have a look and just say, what do they think? Um, and yeah, I think just go for it and try it because the power is in the letters that come in the, in the nomination letter. And as people have said, particularly in the endorsement letters, they're the really ones that are really important about making the arguments. And the web pages have a whole lot of good information and it feels like many nominators and endorsers don't read those web pages enough because there's so much good information there about how to write a good endorsement letter. Um, so yeah, they, they work, they work. Well, I, 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 yeah, sure, go, go ahead. No, I just wanted to make a comment, um, just reflecting on the potential impact of the pandemic and the transition to conferences being uh, online or hybrid. Um, I think throughout this seminar, it has become evident that having a, sort of like a broad professional network of uh, scientists uh, or practitioners in your field that know your work is very important because you know we've been saying how the endorsers it's important that they don't come from the same institution you know and the same for um so because it shows that your work is known beyond you know your most immediate radius and a lot of the visibility is achieved through going to conferences and giving talks and talking to people, you know, in the coffee breaks and things like that. So I wonder if we, if what are your thoughts on um, the impact that this uh, hybrid or virtual format might have on, um, on sort of like establishing those networks, particularly for researchers that are early on on their careers and they are missing this opportunity to be able to you know, meet and chat and, and discuss and, 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 and find, you know, sort of like potential collaborations with people beyond their institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point, I think. Um, there is another question here, which uh, seems to be relevant. Can you briefly mention the criteria to qualify for applying for each grade? Um, John, would you like to say something? Um. For my per having watched this program over many years, just as uh, in a short summary, I would say that when you applied for the grade of senior member, uh, basically you're attesting that you've been a member of ACM for at least five years. Um, you can self-nominate, you have to have endorsements, but basically what the committee and the decision process is looking for is contributions, you know, that you're an ACM member that you're making contributions uh, to your local institution, to your field, and that you've got endorsers who will attest to that. When you move on to distinguished member, you're looking to sort of increasing the level of contribution and impact. Um, 
And so that's got to come through in the nomination and the endorsements. And it probably means some impact outside of your immediate circle. Uh, you know, when you get to fellow, you're looking for contributions that have definitely had impact outside of your local space. You know, you've impacted other researchers in other parts of the world. Um, and it's sort of, from my point of view, the simplest first cut is the sphere of impact you've had grows, if that helps. Thank you, thank you very much. So there is another question, actually two questions that are in the same direction. The condition of five years professional ACM membership seems enough to get nominated. Why not reduce it to two years? And there is somebody else who complains about, so he says that he has joined recently he is an IEEE fellow. He has uh, done work for the IEEE, and now he has joined. Uh, he has joined the ACM to find out that he has to wait for five years in order to apply for becoming an ACM fellow. So uh, I know Anastasia, you have done a lot of work in this direction. Would you like to comment? <laughs> Uh, but what is the dimension of the of what they what question do I comment on? So do you think that uh, we could further reduce this to two years? Are there reasons not to do so? Uh, uh, that's think? something that's something that has to do with uh, about five levels higher than I am. I mean, I'm totally uh, I'm, the work that I'm doing uh, has to do with. Uh, um, you know, pinpointing, helping to 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 discover, to unearth, if you will, unappreciated value uh, or underappreciated value in the eyes of ACM, right? Because nobody brought uh, that value to their attention in Europe, and and uh, hoping to do that and putting all my energy there now. Um, as to the requirements, as I said, I've buzzed people's ears every now and then about the five years consecutive. Uh, a requirement for fellows that was a huge problem and uh, uh, I mean that got relaxed quite significantly um, to qualify for more people to qualify. Now I, I, I think I'm ill equipped to judge as to whether more relaxing the, the rules further is uh, definitely if that happened we would enlarge the pool of nominees so that would be good. Uh, but ACM is a large organization. There are dimensions uh, of it that um, um, are not within my scope of, of activity and the reasons for these rules adhere more to those dimensions. So I would rather leave this question from someone who's more knowledgeable at that level. Vim, would you like to comment? Or John? Or but, but I'll let John. I mean, um, you know, my, my okay. years five years is, 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 is reasonable. What's what's the big deal to, to wait five years? So the um, five years comes from when the fellows program was launched, which is the oldest of the member grade programs. It was launched in uh, 1993. And at the time, number one, it was a member grade recognition. You had to be a member. And so there was the expectation that you just don't show up and become a fellow. You have to have been a member of the ACM for five continuous years. And then as was recently pointed out last year or the year before, we relaxed that to be five years of membership over the previous 10, I think it is. So there could be breaks in that. When distinguished member and senior member came along, again, since they were member grades, the membership requirement came with them. You know, it's just part of the nature of the, the recognition. I mean, over the years, you know, we would have Turing Award winners uh, who weren't even ACM members, would become ACM members, and somebody would say, well, why don't we make them a fellow? And the answer was, well, yeah, we'll make them a fellow after they've been a member five years. So if you look at Alan Kay, for example, became a fellow five years after he received the Turing Award. Uh, so it really is a member grade versus a technical recognition. Sure. So all these people should try the awards instead uh, at first and then 
you know, after five years, they can also. It is true though that, uh, you know, this reduces the pool of people who can, who can be nominated. And this is a problem that um, Anastasia has experienced in her working group a lot. Uh, okay, there is, uh, maybe this is gonna be the last question because uh, um, uh, the time has passed and uh, we have to close it somewhere. Um, there is one question, is it not true that American scientists uh, have many networking opportunities through NSF workshops that would boost the profile of US researchers among themselves? Uh, what about researchers from Asia? Is it not hard for them to boost the profile of their work? They only have the conferences and tags to workshops, so on and uh, um, methanes to boost the profile of their work. They do not have access to NSF workshops to promote their work. And there are similar things in the chat where they say that um, Europeans have to work in projects and they have, uh, so the cultural issues that we were discussing previously. Does anybody want to comment on this? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and comment is that, you know, I think um, NSF workshops are not about boosting your profile, they're about <laughs> obtaining funding. And there are plenty of equivalents in Europe. They have different names. Um, you can go and uh, go attend lots of workshops to obtain funding in Europe. This is not really sort of what we're looking for, um, you know, in terms of at least the fellow nominees. Um, you know, it's what you have done with the funding that you have uh, obtained that determines uh, what the rest of the community sees you and how successful they see you and what kind of letters you get written. So I don't think that there's any sort of secret society in the United States. There's no sort of better opportunities in the United States uh, than there is uh, anywhere else. You know, there are people in certain communities who I think just write lots of journal articles and don't seem to go to conferences and they get to be fellows. There are other communities where people go to conferences and don't write journal articles and they get to be fellows. There are people in industry who get to be fellows with sort of no journal articles and no conference articles because of the strength of their impact. So really what it is, is what do you do with the resources that you have available? And you know, what impact does your uh, efforts have uh, on the computer community, computer science community, the tech community at large, and what can you uh, sort of bring to the table and get people to say about it. So, you know, I don't think people should focus in like we do it differently in this country than we do it in this other country because you can be successful with lots of starting points. So maybe just to, to complement this, it's about impact. All of these grades or awards, it's all about impact. So if a candidate believes they should be a nominee because they've, they, have, they have impact, then they should talk to someone uh, who knows about their impact, who that works maybe close to them or not uh, in some capacity and explain. And uh, usually you don't really have to explain <laughs> that much. And then that other person finds you know, goes around and looks for people who know are the recipients of that impact, people who followed on on the work, people who have been benefited in one way or another from the uh, results of the work of the of the nominee. And that's that. That's the group. That's the nomination group. In the end, it's not really rocket science. And I also don't believe that there is a segregation there or a matter even, I'm going to go out of the limit and say it's not even a matter of opportunities or uh, or social connections or whatnot. This is just a sheer impact question. So Geraldine, we, we are out of time, but we are gonna continue informally for maybe five minutes more just to uh, have yeah, the time for everybody to... Yeah, Nuria, thank you very sorry, much. Sorry, I'm and, sorry, uh, I'm already running late. Uh, sorry about this. It's okay, uh, it's thank okay. You thank you very much for your participation. Yeah, thank also, you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Sign thank, you. thank you very ciao. much. Yeah. Ciao, ciao. Bye, everyone. Uh, Have a good weekend. Um, bye. I just wanted to reinforce it, connecting to a couple of the other questions. Do you mind about, to speak a little bit closer to your mic? Yeah, we. I just seem to have a concert starting in the square outside. Um, I, just to, uh, questions around the, uh, you know, like not knowing ACM fellows or DMs or whatever to endorse you. 
And what I'd want to um, reinforce is the impact story and that an, an enthusiastic letter from someone who really knows your work and can attest to it is much stronger than a, a lukewarm letter that's generic from someone who can put ACM fellow after their name. And the, if you look at the webpage and the, and the recommendations, it only says it's preferable, it's not required. So not necessarily having strong connections with lots of fellows doesn't mean you can't get good letters. It's the content um, that, that matters. And the, the, the COVID impact as well, I just wanted to comment on, because I think we also have to recognise that um, you know, the, the impacts of COVID have been very mixed for people. For some people, it has resulted in uh, less networking. For other people, it's opened up new opportunities because they don't normally uh, have travel open to them. And here they are now able to attend conferences that they couldn't access before. So I'm, I'm also wondering whether in future years we're going to need COVID impact statements attached to uh, promotion cases and nomination cases, again, that help interpret and contextualise people's situations. Thank you. Okay, so uh, there is one last question. There are a lot of questions that can be answered easily offline, so we can just store them and process them later on and submit some feedback to the to the participants. But uh, what about this one? Could you please, um, could it be possible to get some additional clarification about how the impact is analyzed for private sector nominations, which would not be based on publications and conferences, even though the practitioner career would be focused on innovation projects? This is in the chat. So um, Roy, would you like to say something? Or John, Jim, <laughs> I guess this is a question oh. for the chairs. I'll take a crack at it. Um, having been in the industry, um, maybe I can offer a little view on this. Um, you know, impact within a within a company uh, certainly can be reported upon, and usually in a way that uh, doesn't run into confidentiality issues or things like that. Um, so. It's real, I'm really, in a sense, repeating what's been said before. Yes, the metric is going to be different than it would be for uh, someone in, in academia. Um, you don't have the external mechanisms of, uh, of that sort. But somebody knowledgeable with, within a company or ideally even from another company, if your impact extends beyond a company, you can get a recommendation from someone or an endorsement from somebody else. Obviously, that says something. Um, so I think that, the, that again, it's, if I repeat a little bit what John said, it has to do with the, the breadth of your circle. Look at the size of the circle, look at where your impact has been, and look for people who can attest to that impact within your company or outside your company, um, and, and uh, try, to, try to get that as, to be as, as uh, specifically stated as possible. Thank you. Does anybody else want to add something? You know, I would say that it's very helpful for these nominees to get at some of the letters from academics who are familiar with their work so that it's not just people with inside their company. I mean, those, those nominations are extremely difficult to evaluate. The work may be extremely significant, but the impact is sometimes extremely unclear and the details are very obscure because of the jar jargon, the awards that go with a, a particular company, the sort of technical details aren't written down. Um, so if there's somebody external, particularly somebody in academia who can sort of calibrate this against other companies and against academic research, it's very helpful for us to understand the significance of it. Um, uh, the, the, the most difficult ones are clearly the ones that come from within inside a company and you know, the details of the work are proprietary and we vaguely know about the product, but we don't necessarily know about anybody's contributions to the product. And you know, you know, have some pity on the committee and, and try to make our life a little easier by helping us uh, evaluate what the impact is in that case. You know, but having said that, we have done this, right? You know, one that comes to mind was uh, a person um, who worked at a government agency where literally the details 
of their exact contributions were classified. And so there literally had to be letters from people who were well known, who had the appropriate classifications attesting to their work being significant without actually being able to tell us what their work was. And there had to be enough of them and they had to be convincing enough that we actually believed it. And so, you know, it can happen uh, even in sort of the most difficult circumstances, but it's unusual. Thank you. I think this is uh, really helpful for the people to know. Uh, I think we are um, reaching the end and I'm gonna give you uh, just one minute to the four of you who are still here to summarize and probably provide some final tips and advice if you want. So Zim, would you like to go first? Yeah, I mean, you know, the simplest thing is if you want these uh, awards, uh, you know, apply for them. <laughs> You're not gonna get them. We're not gonna go seek you out and uh, give you the award unless you apply for it. So, you know, with the self-nomination, it seems very easy uh, to do it. With the other ones, you basically need to find somebody who will take the lead on it. And the person who does it needs to follow best practices. It's very clear, you know, ACM has done a very good job of putting up uh, material on the website that explain exactly what we're looking for. Make our life easy and you'll be much more successful. The, the, the nominations where it's hard for us to understand what the significance is or where people sort of depend on like numbers, you know, so-and-so published this many hundreds of things and it has an H index of such and such. You know, every academic has those numbers, but that doesn't really sort of tell us what they did that has impact. So help us, tell us what's significant, what's important, where the impact was, and tell us in a variety of different ways because we're not all experts in your field and you'll have a significantly better chance of getting the award. Thank you, Roy. What Jim said. <laughs> Good, <laughs> it's on. <laughs> um, yeah, what Jim said, but I will also add, think about that in the context of all of the ACM awards, whether it's from doctoral dissertation through the Turing Award, um, make nominations of colleagues in Europe, and now you know what needs to go into a nomination. So Geraldine, would you like to add something for those who are not that senior just, to go for an ACM fellow very... or an ACM award? <laughs> but I, no, I just want to pick up on Catherine Flick's uh, question there about social ethical impacts or interdisciplinary things. Oh, yes, think. that was an important and one. You are right. This is all part of making the argument. So pick, tick whatever you think the most, you know, the the best fit is, even if it's not perfect, and just use the text to make the argument because it's an evolving organization. And I think the ACM and computing science more generally is reflected in Gabrielle's um, comments at the beginning, is accepting more and more that we're more than just technology from this very narrow uh, technology centric point of view. So, you know, it's possible to make arguments that it's a contribution to computer science through these sorts of impacts. It uh, let me, may, let me just say- Systems may be slow to change, but we can- Let me just say, this is absolutely true for the fellows. We are perfectly happy with having people come in and say, you know, this is an application of technology that's significant, that has sort of benefits. Um, you know, the things that you check actually aren't even visible to the committee. They don't appear on the, the forums that the committee sees. I get a spreadsheet with a huge number of ticks listed next to everybody, which I use to try to assign uh, people to read the letters, but it isn't actually that useful. So um, don't worry about it. <laughs> if there's not an appropriate tick, submit the application anyways. Thank you. Thank you all four of you. Just let me say a few words. This is just the closing. Uh, um, uh, we will collect the questions that have not been answered, work on them and send you additional information to answer them uh, offline after the, the end of the webinar. I think those that have not been answered yet uh, are kind of uh, um, the questions that we can easily answer offline. Uh, we have uh, set up a Google form 
for you and uh, you are going to receive the link uh, once this uh, uh, this this uh, webinar is over and you can you will also be directed to um uh, to, to, to 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 the to the form through your browser once the once you leave the, the webinar and uh, before we finish, I would like to thank uh, some people who have participated. To, 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 to I want to, to, to thank to, to thank all those who have contributed to make this uh, webinar uh, happen. Uh, Gabriel Kotsis, the ASEAN president first, uh, the, the six panel members, thank you very much for being here and for all these uh, wonderful discussions and uh, uh, all this information that you have provided. I would like to acknowledge the support of uh, the members of RISE. Uh, we discuss a lot and uh, I, they helped me a lot to figure out what, the, what are the right uh, uh, directions to go. Uh, a huge thanks uh, goes to Jan Timanowski from the ACM headquarters for uh, uh, installing all the infrastructure that uh, we use today. And to Pat Ryan from, uh, again, the ACM headquarters. Uh, she's the CEO uh, of ACM. She is very supportive always. Uh, but the biggest thanks of all goes to all of you for participating. Thanks for being here today with us and uh, for making this event happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Uh, Bye to everybody. It. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.